I'll try to do my little intro with uh, first try, no warm ups. Hopefully I pronounced your last name right. I was gonna say it wrong already, so I'm glad I asked. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to the Long Lens Podcast. This is the podcast where I answer questions from my YouTube community and I just talk about filmmaking and YouTube. Today, I'm pretty excited because I have a pretty special guest on the podcast today, Jake Felzine. He's a filmmaker, YouTuber, video editor, and fellow Lumix shooter. So I'm excited to talk all things YouTube and filmmaking and video editing with him. Jake, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Dude, Nigel, thank you so much. This smile is so genuine. Because I'm just <laughs> so stoked to be here and pumped to meet you, man. I can't wait to can't wait to yeah. talk with you. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I feel like we've kind of been like like YouTube. I mean, we've been like you know like following each other on YouTube for a little while now. I think the first time I saw one of your videos was probably weren't you shooting like Micro Four Thirds at some point? That's probably how I found yeah, you. Yeah, dude, I was huge Micro Four Third shooter and like my whole channel used to be about that because I just loved kind of like you and I'm trying to remember like you may have been a huge inspiration where I was just like budget matters like can we get yeah good camera quality from and not buy into the Sony and Canon hype and all of that and I was really into that sphere for a long time had the G7 uh GH5S nice. Pocket 4K G9 Heck had the yeah. G original G9, which that new G9 Ooh. 2 looks so delicious. <laughs> yeah, um, I never had the original G9, but that was always one that I was like, I don't know, I always had in the back of my mind because I feel like Micro Four Thirds by Lumix, that was the one that had the most usable autofocus, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, for photos, it was an incredible camera. Like, yeah. I and I, I, I do a lot of uh, like backpacking and outdoor stuff, and yeah. I just kind of didn't know what I was buying. And that camera was the best for that. Yeah. And then I kind of learned that because it didn't have, I think it eventually got Vlog L through mm -hmm. a firmware update. Yeah. Um, but it didn't have like really great video specs. And I just didn't know anything about specs. And yeah. so I was kind of like quickly, I, I kind of started to learn more and was like, oh, this camera is missing a lot of stuff I want, but yeah. like for as a photo camera, it was incredible. Well, that's cool because yeah. like the reason that I get Micro Four Thirds cameras still, like I still have like a little uh, G85 is just because yeah. they're so small, you know, and I like to yes. do like I like to hike and backpack and stuff like that, too. It's just like the S5 II is small, but it's not small enough. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah, totally. I feel that so much. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of want to get like a little bit of a background on you. Like when did you first get into like the whole filmmaking world? I would say seriously, probably around like 2017 ish is okay. when I really started getting into it. My kind of background in this sphere is mostly like most of the creative interest from my past is all music based. So like did a lot of garage band stuff. I've got a keyboard right here you know like all my audio equipments from that past life and just really loved making silly music <laughs> just kind of through the ebbs and flows of interest and whatnot found filmmaking through i, I think mostly pete and casey in the early days around 2017 and then just kind of got obsessed with wanting to learn photo and video related type stuff and yeah that kind of kicked off the whole micro four thirds era which was really fun yeah just made a lot of content around that and then my son was born <laughs> and i had a hard time getting out into the wild with my cameras as much as i would have liked um all good reasons of course like life happens and it's hard to do it and then uh just kind of got more into the editing side of things to stay creative at home, basically. And then that's kind of been my kick lately is sort of the blend of all of it with a real focus on editing and music stuff again. But obviously, like we're talking about here, and I could talk with you for hours yeah, <laughs> about yeah. I've got the S5 II that I just bought. I freaking love it. It's yeah. the best camera I've ever owned. I had the S5, you know, we talked about the G9, like I still... Yeah obviously use cameras and it's very important to everything <laughs> yeah no i'm sure we'll get into that more but like is this so is like is video editing what you do like as a full-time job now it's not my full-time job okay uh, i actually work in tech full -time. oh really um, cool yeah that's what kind of pays the bills and then yeah. i sort of moonlight with uh video editing and youtube kind of a mixture um, okay. I've done a little bit less client work lately because the channel's just been insane so yeah i I've, i haven't been as proactive to reach out for editing gigs just because i'm like man i'm swamped with my stuff which is a great problem to have 
but I do really like that and I like editing for people and uh I could totally see that being you know something that always happens for as long as I even do my channel like I think I'll still do some flavor of that but yeah have you gotten any like opportunities to like do like like YouTube specific editing or has it been like mostly like, you know, corporate type stuff? It's actually mostly been YouTube. Really? Which is kind of what's funny. So yeah, so when I, when I, when my son was born and I was kind of looking to find that creative outlet, um, the thing that started it all off is TMS Productions. I don't know if you've ever watched their channel. Yes, yeah, 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 um, for sure. Yeah, they were hiring an editor on Instagram and it was kind of one of those just like super easy Google forms to apply to. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, what the heck? I'm just sitting here, you know, during nap time, holding my son. Like I might as well, I can get my phone out and apply to this. That's pretty easy. And, uh, shot that and long story short, got the gig and worked with them for a long time. The first gig was initially a course with them. So it wasn't something YouTube facing, mm -hmm. um, but it went well. And they were like, Hey, do you want to edit YouTube videos? So I actually did pretty much all of their videos for I think that was most of last year so like all of the spec ad videos were mostly edited by me oh, wow. minus the ads they like to edit the ads obviously because that's yeah. kind of their finished product but the whole video leading up to that for sure um i edited and then from there i've kind of worked for a couple of other youtubers here and there like i've done some videos for done did it oh wow i did an episode for patrick tomaso um oh, do i love patrick stuff dude patrick's <laughs> the best i know so he's good. so sick so good he's so good yeah um, so yeah, I've kind of been in that sphere here and there. And again, I haven't been shopping around as much cause my, I'm so busy. Yeah, I yeah. wish I had more time cause I love working with these people, but <laughs> for sure. Well, I mean, I guess you kind of already like touched on it, but like, was there something specific that made you kind of pivot? Cause I feel like when I started watching you, your stuff was mostly like, you know, filmmaking gear related. And then you kind of mm -hmm. pivoted towards like the video editing side. Was that mostly just because you wanted to still have a creative outlet that you could do even with the, like your main job or was it just that you didn't find as much like you just liked video editing more yeah i think it was a combination of almost everything you just said like mm -hmm. i think i was kind of falling out of love with the gear and camera stuff a little bit yeah and i think and i'd be kind of curious to hear your perspective on this too because you're i think you had kind of hinted at it in your last video that maybe you're feeling a little bit of the same thoughts of it's just all so good, yeah. right? Like, especially again, like I, I held out for a long time before I bought the S5 too, because I was like, I have the S5, like yeah. the S5 is amazing. I don't need it. I don't need it. I finally bought it. And I, I don't know why I was being such a stick in the mud because <laughs> having autofocus is incredible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, no, for sure. But it's just one of those cameras that like, as soon as I got it out, it's just like, I don't even know. I don't even know what I could want anymore and i've never felt this way like yeah. computers are kind of that way cameras are that way where it's just like i'm sure they'll come up with things that'll blow my mind but i don't know what i want and yeah. i never had that happen in the seven years of doing this yeah so yeah i just kind of i kind of feel like the camera space isn't really as interesting at least from the gear side like yeah. obviously making videos is sick and yeah. that's still and i think that's kind of where i'm at it's just like editing is sort of a new love and but but also an old love because i think yeah. again coming from that music background i realized that i just really like editing in a track based piece of software and mixing together music and visuals to to tell a story and i just kind of didn't know that i loved that too much until again my son was born and i started editing as a job and people were like, oh yeah, we, we don't like this as much as filming. We like the filming side. We'd love to have someone edit. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess I just haven't really asked around. I thought everyone just loved editing. And it's yeah. like, well, a lot of people, it's like maybe not even their favorite part necessarily. Yeah. You know? And I was like, that is my favorite part. The shooting is yeah. the part I have to go do so that I can edit something. For sure. <laughs> yeah, no, so. I mean, I totally, I can totally like see where you're coming from with the whole like you know, the gear stuff is cool, but it's just not, I mean, like we're definitely living in a day and age where like everything is just so good that it's just like, what more can we really expand on, you know, as far as like, I mean, and that was kind of like the whole, you know, the whole like reason I started my channel is because I wanted to see how good I could get these, you know, these cheaper cameras to look. But now yes. that we have these really good cameras that aren't really that expensive, it's like, and then we have, you know, like I shoot 
or like I edit on an M1 Max MacBook Pro that's like super fast and you know I can like watch and play back everything at like full resolution and it's just like super fast. I was like, okay, well I don't need anything else. You know what I mean? So I totally, totally. see it. The yeah. fact that I can talk to you, be recording an audio track in Logic and like I don't hear anything yeah. is a problem we used to have to think about. Like yeah. you could, if I was on my Intel Mac, I'd be like, okay, where do I hide this thing to try to like muffle the noise? No, I, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. Cause I recently just updated my Mac and like, I was so used to like the jet engine sound starting up whenever I wanted to like pre-render something, but now I don't even have to pre-render anything. It just plays back smoothly. I'm just like, oh, this is crazy. Like, how does this even working without a, like a jet engine going off? It's yeah. so crazy. Oh. It's so up. I even recently have been using my old, I think it's, I think it's an i9. I'm trying to remember when I bought it, Yeah. but basically my last Intel Mac before going Apple Silicon. And I was like, I really like that it's small. Cause that yeah. was the era where they were like really thin, but like had all kinds of thermal issues. Yeah. And I was like, I th I'd like to kind of like not waste this computer. And so I've kind of like turned it into my float around the house, like script writing computer, which is totally such an expensive solution for yeah. what I'm using it for. But otherwise it's just like, it's going to collect dust because it sucks for anything else. Yeah. And I was just like, I had pages up. I was just working on a script this morning. I was like, oh, my lap's getting kind of toasty and I'm just yeah. in a word editor. <laughs> Whereas I could be like in Resolve, you know, in Final Cut on my lap on my new one. And it's like, you got to render before it starts getting oh, hot. For sure. <laughs> for sure. It's funny. Cause I just, I recently just uh, sold my old I nine to my parents cause they were using some old, like, like mm -hmm. super cheap laptop. It's like here, this is probably more than what you need, but you know, it's, it's going to be a lot better yeah. than what you're currently using. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so uh, funny. Well, I mean, you kind of just touched on my next question, which is what is your editing software of choice? Because since you're a video editor, I'm assuming you have yeah. strong opinions on, on this subject. I do. I do. I, so I started in Final Cut. Well, okay. I mean, my first real professional software was Final Cut. Okay. Obviously, um, back in the budget days, I was even trying to use like free editors on Linux computers. I mean, I was oh, like wow. super jank yeah. <laughs> back in the day. Um, and again, I got my degree in computer science, so I was also like using Linux computers. So that was kind of part of the reason there. But um, yeah, yeah, first big boy editor was Final Cut. And to this day, I still absolutely love it. I think it is just an incredible piece of software. Gosh, there's so many things I hate about it. And there's just so many things I love about it. When I bought the Pocket 4K, it obviously came with a free DaVinci license. Yeah. And I had played around with it a little bit. Um, at the time, they really weren't full bore into DaVinci beyond color grading and like a few basic editing things. Mm -hmm. And then I think like a year or two later, 17 came out and that's when they really started to go nuts. And it was kind of around that time that, I don't know what it was, I was just feeling a little burnt on Final Cut, which I think in hindsight was just not totally knowing what limitations were there and buying plugins and kind of not wanting to pay a whole bunch of money. So I just felt a little trapped in kind of this ceiling Yeah, um, that probably could have been broken with a bunch of plugins in hindsight. But it just because I already had it, I was like, I'm going to try learning Resolve. Mm -hmm. And then really did start to see what, what I was missing, right? What that ceiling was, um, which is a huge list. I don't know if we need to get yeah, into yeah. it. But, but basically, um, long story short, I'm like, I spent so much time learning Resolve that now I'm pretty much 50-50. <laughs> okay. Like, I, I really go project to project on what I want to use. I will say they just came out with the 19 version on Friday. They keep adding stuff that just makes it harder and harder to not just use DaVinci for everything, but okay. So I would say probably like, like gun to my head, had to, had to pick, couldn't, couldn't use the other one. I'd be picking resolve. Okay. Uh, but I do, I do like the duality for both my sanity and just kind of having that flexibility for certain things being better than others. Well, do you find that like the YouTubers that you worked with, like, do they prefer one or the other 
or as most people, because I feel like I feel like I'm definitely mm-hmm. in the minority because I am still a Premiere user. I've been using Adobe Premiere since 2007, back when it was like CS3, and I just can't. Like I've tried, I swear I've tried really hard to switch to DaVinci, but I just can't. I just I'm so much faster in Premiere. But I know that there are some yeah. people that are like that with with Final Cut, where it's just like they can edit super fast in Final Cut, but DaVinci is a little bit more of like they gotta like massage it a little bit. Like, have you found yeah. that like? Like most YouTubers are in DaVinci or are they still doing Final Cut or what? I don't think I don't think it's too inside baseball. I'm pretty sure I can talk about this, but like yeah. so with TMS, we all mm-hmm. used DaVinci Resolve. And that was again just because it was so easy to bounce project files. And the the project files in Resolve are like these tiny little text files. And so it was just super easy to like share those back and forth, which I think yeah. that's probably how it is in Premiere as well. Final Cut is not good at that. So that's okay. why Final Cut typically hasn't been the go-to for yeah for collaborative work so that so yeah so we use davinci dunna and i use davinci and we even use the cloud version which has oh, been okay. pretty cool to play with it's got some quirks yeah <laughs> but it's pretty sweet and then um funny enough i used resolve with patrick and in hindsight i should have used final cut and i think i would i would say that to anyone who's kind of getting into editing like it's a tough pill to swallow, but I think especially if you're working in our space to ask someone what they use and then yeah. to use that software. Because at the end of the day, if there's like 2% that they want to finish or, you know, whatever it is, like like we all like a little bit of control, obviously, even if we hand off help. So it definitely benefits to be like, okay, if I know Resolve and Final Cut, but I know Patrick Tommaso uses Final Cut, well, then I'm just going to edit it in Final Cut so that at the end of the day, if he does choose to want to have a little bit of control, it's not hard, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, that, it's been a pretty good mix of both. And I think Resolve is just getting more prevalent because it's so much easier to collaborate. But just depends. Are you like interested in color grading too? And since you use Resolve so much, is that something that you kind of like dove into? I mean, more than I ever had before. Yeah. But not, not really. I yeah. would not say it's a strength. Um, okay. The tools in Resolve are so good that, like, I think even uh, someone with not a lot of skill like myself can can do some damage, which is pretty fun. Yeah. Um, they've got a lot, like, all of the effects just look so much better. Like, and I don't, I, I haven't, I hate to admit it, I've never used Premiere. Well, yeah. I have, but it was so short and I <laughs> gave up so quickly because I was just like, what the heck? I don't need this <laughs> software in my life. Like I'm not paying for this. I've got the other two and they were yeah. great. I don't, I don't need to pay more money. But like, if you wanted to add like a nice glow to like a light in your background or something like that, like final cuts glow effect just looks so elementary. I don't yeah. even know. Like it just looks amateur but resolves it's like drag and drop and like it's got a thousand different sliders and things you can tweak but even just throwing it on there you're like wait did you use like a promise filter on this like it looks really good so like stuff yeah. like that is just really really nice and resolve because i always thought i sucked at color grading and then i was like okay i think you just need the right tool for the yeah. right job for sure but, and that's I mean, that's the main reason why I still use Resolve. And it's like, I strictly just use it for color. Like I haven't, I mean, I've done a couple of like, like actual, you know, cuts with Resolve, but I just, I don't, I don't know. There's like, I even mapped out all of my Adobe keys onto Resolve. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, I just still can't bring myself to like use it as like a cutting tool. But yeah. like all of my LUTs I create inside of Resolve because it is just so much better to like just fine tune your colors. But then I just like, I create LUTs there and then I just, I use them in Premiere. <laughs> so yeah. I don't have to like- No, that makes total sense. Yeah. Do you, so, okay, so you make the LUTs in mm-hmm. Resolve. Are you, So you're not like uh, doing like XML bouncing or like rendering, you're just like making the LUTs and then bringing yeah. them back. Okay. Yeah, okay. especially if it's like, if it's like a specific video, like for like my talking heads, uh, for like my YouTube stuff, like for each mm-hmm. new camera that I get, like I'll probably take in like a shot, you know, like my A-roll shot and I'll grade it. And then I'll just say, you know, S52X indoor studio, you know, dot cube yep. or whatever. And I'll just save yep. that. And then whenever I'm making a video, I can just pull it up in Premiere and say, okay, that's the grade that I like and we're good. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's genius. And I would tell, I would tell a lot of people, that's so cool that you do that because I would tell a lot of people like, even if you like another software like Final Cut or 
premiere. I think there's still a lot of value that Resolve brings to the table potentially. And because, I mean, A, the free version has, I think, almost all of the color grading tools. Yeah. So like for color grading, it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you can buy the studio one time and like just kind of have it, right? And, yeah. and think about things that you might need from it. And yeah, it's, it, and they keep adding so many tools like all of the transcription stuff lately i have been just obsessed with it's saving me so much time <laughs> for yeah. like finding things and video clips that are hours long and you can just search for it like that is pretty magical to have in your video editor <laughs> yeah i know and that's the thing is that like i see the value that da vinci is offering and i know that like at some point i know that i'm going to have to like switch fully but like, I feel like right now, you know, because I try to put out a couple of videos a month, I just feel like mm -hmm. I'm just going to stick with Premiere until, like, it just gets too... Because, I mean, like, Premiere just upped their... Or I guess Adobe just upped their prices. Like, not a lot, but it's, like, a dollar extra. I was like, okay, fine. Like, it's like, you know, it's an extra <sighs> dollar, but they just yeah. keep on... They just keep on, like, just hiking the price up, and it's just a... Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, <laughs> man, DaVinci is free, and I have it already, but I'm paying to use this just because I know I'm faster at it, but... If you like locked right. me in a room for like a month, I could probably get as fast on DaVinci. I'm just stubborn and I don't want to do it. <laughs> and I totally sympathize with that. And that's the thing. Like I, I hope anyone who watches my channel, like I, I try to be silly and I definitely have probably had a lot of hot takes that, you know, out of context, again, about software <laughs> yeah. that people probably are like, oh, Jake is being silly there. But like totally to your point, like I... I even though I have all kinds of beef with the Adobe Creative Cloud for being so expensive, like again, like you know, you got to use what works for you, and I'm that is like my number one, like Jake Felzine pillar is like yeah, a be a dork, b right tool, right job, you know, yeah, and for um, sure. So I totally sympathize with that, and and I would even say again, like it took me probably several, and again, this was kind of doing a mixture of both so that definitely slows down your your like you're saying i didn't lock myself in a room i was kind of dabbling here and there but after years like i would finally say like okay toe to toe i think i could cut something and get you the same final product at the same speed but that's after workflow tweaks lots of different hotkey trial and error like it's yeah. taken me a long time to feel like resolve is finally there with final cut yeah <laughs> and i don't have a lot of like there's not a lot of sauce going on with final cut like there's a couple of hot keys i swear by but it is just i think a better interface for speed and yeah. it performs better so i guess i'm here's a question for you sure when it comes to premiere and resolve they're both track based whereas final cuts magnetic and mm -hmm. does weird stuff and we've all got opinions on that what is it that you find slows you down because you said you even brought over your hot keys like what yeah. is it about resolve because again i just don't know premiere very well that yeah. is like clunky for you because i'm so curious about that yeah well i feel like it's mostly just the interface like the actual cutting is very similar to premiere but sometimes okay. if there's like a certain tool that i would use like very very rarely and it's called something in premiere it takes mm -hmm. forever to find what the equivalent is in DaVinci. And I feel like it's probably the same with, with Final Cut, where it's just like, I just wish everyone would use the same terminology, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. Premiere uses make edit, and that's, or it might be Resolve use make edit, but that's what you would, you know, you would click to like split a clip or something like that. And in DaVinci, it's like split clip in, you know, in Premiere, it's make, edit. I don't know what it is in Final Cut, but it's like, why can't we just all call it split clip or something, you know? Because it's like, when I'm doing like, yeah. you know, like my cutting, I just want split clip, you know, like ripple delete and my selection tool all in, you know, like like at my fingertips. But it's like, I have to like learn the terminology for each different editing system. I feel like that's what's, mm -hmm. like that's what slows me down the most. And I'm honestly still like, when it comes to, you know, like that secondary timeline that you see, like in like the, the color tab, that's still kind of, like, I don't even know why, but it still kind of throws me off sometimes, you know, when I'm in the color tab and yeah. I see like all my clips there, I'm like, okay, what am I doing? Like, why? Like, I don't know. It's just, I, I, like, I feel like it's just the interface sometimes that kind of throws me off. And when I, yeah. you know, I'm so, I'm so used to just, you know, going quickly to one spot or the other, it just can kind of slow me down. I like the way that Premiere works in my head, it like makes a lot of sense, you know, and I forget, I don't know if 
if Danny Gewurz was talking about this like recently, but I think that, you know, he was kind of saying the same thing. I think he still does all of his stuff in premiere. And it's just like, it just makes sense in he my does. head. So like, I just, that's why I haven't switched yet. And I know that it's not the best editing software out there. Like I know that it's, you know, inferior in a lot of ways to DaVinci, but again, you know, I've been using it for such a long time. It's just really hard to like, it's not necessarily learning a new program. It's like unlearning the program that I'm so used to. <laughs> yeah. Well, and a little bit of a self plug, stay tuned. Cause I do know that Danny does still use Premiere. So really? uh, little teaser there. Okay. Of what may, what may be coming. <laughs> no, I'm excited. I'm excited because I feel like the Premiere users are starting to like dwindle down into like this, this, uh, yeah. <laughs> this minority almost. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so funny too. Cause actually like right before this episode or right before we started recording, I actually watched a video of a guy and he had a really valid argument as to why he actually thinks Premiere might make a resurgence if they can fix a lot of their stability issues. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, I'm trying to think of like the best summary, but it, it, it was kind of a nerdy deep dive into just like vector graphics after effects and all of that stuff and how resolve just like doesn't handle any of that well yeah and of course it can't because it doesn't have like adobe illustrator you know yeah. and it doesn't have after effects and yeah and i've and i felt that way too and and i think kind of what you're getting at and i've always felt this way because in final cut when i'm working on an edit again even though i'm pretty limited in my tools at least they're all there right yeah. like here is my timeline and if i want to color grade something my tool is accessible here maybe it's hidden in a toggle tab or whatever so instead of seeing my inspector with transform i've got you know i got to click a button to see my color wheels or whatever but it's right there yeah and i could see it and i'm still in the mindset of where my playhead is where my edit is and same thing with graphics if i want to do keyframes even though it sucks in final cut like it's all right there yeah Whereas in Resolve, like you're talking about, the different tabs kind of almost downshifts my brain and I kind of have to think a little bit differently because it's like, okay, now I'm doing a graphic, but I'm in this weird new tab and I've kind of lost what I'm looking at yeah. with my overall story, which is yeah. my you know, timeline film strip. And then like you're saying, same thing with color. And I think in some ways it's a great design because it is kind of having you think about it in stages mm -hmm. but man editing never works out that way editing's messy and i always find like half the time i want to just like get it all done as i'm going you know yeah. like like when i'm when i'm finished with the first minute of a video especially for a jake video like that's usually done like yeah. i'm not usually going back and changing it right and so yeah, yeah doing these passes of different things doesn't really work with how my brain works <laughs> yeah no i'm like i'm the same way and i've even like i don't know i've like i've told with the idea of like doing some editing work for other people too like maybe not youtubers mm -hmm. but for more like corporate type videos and sometimes yeah. i would just wonder like how other people edit because the way that i edit just seems so different than all of these like these youtube editors that i see because like a lot of the times i don't know if you've ever done this in like da vinci because i know da vinci is kind of like the same type of timeline as premiere but like I'll drag something like 10 minutes down the timeline, edit it and save it for later. And then I'll go back to the beginning and I was like, okay, this is going to go somewhere in the middle, but I don't know where yet. So I'm just going to like edit it over here. I'm going to leave it, you know, 10 minutes down the timeline and I'm going to go back to the beginning and fix that, you know? Dude, totally. Yeah. And I would do that in Final Cut. I would do that even worse because in Final Cut, it'll automatically bump stuff. So I would always have to go check videos at the end to like see, did I leave anything floating out here like yeah, that yeah. I forgot to clean up because it'll just keep pushing it indefinitely as you're working on the front stuff. Yeah. Um, no, I do that all the time. Yeah. yeah. I've tried it's, to get better by doing multiple timelines to solve yeah. that problem, but it still happens. <laughs> yeah. I know. Like the only time I'll do like multiple timelines is if I'm doing like from like my most recent videos where I'm like, you know, like working on like a little spec ad or something like that. I'll create the spec yeah. ad on a separate timeline, but usually it's like all on one timeline that I'm doing everything. Yeah. No, it's always interesting seeing how other people's brains work, you know, when it comes to editing. Cause like, I feel like not one person is going to do it the same, you know, even if we get the same result, we're all like, we're all going to go at it like a different way. Oh, for sure. And I think, and again, like as someone who loves looking at software and how we interface with software and tools, like I think that, Im I think that impacts it immensely. Like I yeah. think how you, or what you have learned on, 
you kind of find workarounds to how you do stuff. And yeah, most most people that I talk to that like edit in Final Cut usually like do very linear chronological editing. Not always, but that just seems to be the trend. And then yeah, like Premiere and Resolve, you get a lot more of what you just described. And yeah, yeah, it's just interesting how that how that happens. But well, cool, man. I had okay, so I, I kind of want to like dive into just because I'm kind of like a camera gear nerd. But I kind of yes. want to like, <laughs> I don't know, I kind of want to dive into like what your setup is right now. And then maybe we can go to like what you might want to invest in in the future if you ever wanted to get a new camera. But what are you shooting with right okay. now? So right now, yeah. what the people are seeing is the S5 II. So I'm okay. using that for my podcast. Actually, I'm really using that camera for just about everything. Um, yeah. I still, so as of today, I own the S5 II, which I just bought and mm -hmm. love. Um, I still own the S5 because okay. I've found a lot of use cases for that, which I'll talk about in a second. And then I don't know why, but to this day, I still own my Pocket 4K, which is a Sick. camera that I just hate using. Yeah. <laughs> I just hate using it. And I cannot bring myself to sell it. And I think a big part of it is just, it's one of those cameras that I know that one day I'm going to like show my son or maybe my grandchildren and just be like, look at this weird thing that yeah. you know grandpa used to use yeah. or whatever but but from like a purely functional standpoint i hate that camera it's yeah the battery life is atrocious i hate rigging cameras i hate monitors i hate all these different kinds of dependencies like i love the s5 II because i can stick a mic on top or a wireless mic and i can throw a battery in and i'm like off and going like yeah. it's got an evf if it's bright out and yep. I can use that to check my exposure. It's got a screen that I can see myself with. Like, yeah. I just hate cameras that suck. I mean, in a perfect world, I would like film everything on my iPhone. But for some yeah. reason, I just don't. Well, the reason is, is I just don't love the quality, right? Like, yeah. It just doesn't. I'm I'm constantly wanting my iPhone to look like my S5 II. And then that for would sure. be my perfect, perfect camera. Yeah. But. Well, I'm sure it's probably going to get to that point, you know, at some point in time. But <laughs> yeah. And the 15 seems close. The 15 seems close, but... What lenses do you shoot with on your S5 II? Uh, this, right now, we're using yeah. a 28 to 70 Sigma. Sick. Uh, That's the exact eight. same I have. Oh, <laughs> dude. I So I, I love that lens. Yeah. I really love the kit lens, which I have right here, the yeah. 20 to 60. I like it because it's wide. I'll talk Again, I'll talk about why I've actually got it off because I hadn't taken it off the S5 II since I bought it. And then I yeah. whipped the 28 to 70 back out. And I was like, ah, I love the 28 to 70. Yeah, it's so good. Um, so I, I really, I think for my S5 II, I, I, if I was a betting man and I always tweak everything so of course mm -hmm. this will change but if i was a betting man i bet that lens almost never comes off the camera because it's got good autofocus hardly any focus breathing yeah it's sharper than a freaking diamond blade and it's yeah. got really nice contrast like it's it's just kind of the grail lens for l mount <laughs> yeah and it's not super um, expensive either which i love no yeah yeah it's not and so, and, and my big holdup with the S5 was just like, again, the autofocus wasn't good. So I kind of just didn't love using that lens because it is that mid to long kind of range. So like, obviously I'm filming myself, yeah, but I can't control the focus. So I feel like this setup will probably be like 95% of how I use the S5 II. Yeah. On the S5, and this is, and I love it for the shed. I have the TT Artisans 11 millimeter fisheye. It's a fully manual lens, which is why I didn't sell the S5 because that I feel like I'm not wasting good autofocus with yeah. a manual lens. And I just, I love this lens for creative shed shots because the shed is decent sized, but also yeah. not very big. And it just like makes the space feel really unique so that's kind of the dichotomy right now i think is like that'll be my go-to like really weird lens shots in jake's videos will be that and then like anything standard is with the s5 and that sigma so yeah s5 II. that's awesome yeah so. i mean that's a great setup i mean i feel like like i can accomplish so much with like my s5 2x and the sigma 28 to 70 like it's just such a solid setup to do almost everything with the only other lens that i kind of want to get it, which is kind of like the the brother lens to this is like the 16 to 28 by sigma because i feel like that would be like yeah. a perfect you know like wide but yeah it's great and i do have like a lot of uh lenses that panasonic has uh, let me borrow so it's 
little bit harder for me to like want to switch out from like a Panasonic or, you know, L mount camera just because I have all these lenses that I can use. But like, is there anything, cause I know that you watched my most recent podcast and I think that's where I like, you know, saw you ping. I was like, Oh, it's Jake Felzine. I, I know him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but I was kind of hey, talking. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of talking about like, you know, some of the reasons why someone would want to switch out of a, a Lumix camera. And honestly, I love my S5 2X and I don't see myself selling it or, you know, getting a new camera anytime soon. But is there anything about your S5 II that like, you're like, man, I wish it could do that. Or I wish it had this one feature and then it would be perfect. Yeah. And I feel so nitpicky saying it because mm -hmm. I already feel like this camera is just stupid good. And yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I, yeah, we we, we touched on it earlier. Like, yeah. I don't even know what I could yeah. wish for. But if I am being nitpicky and if I did have to say, like, there might be something that could come out, I think for as much as I love this camera, there is a world where I definitely notice the rolling shutter at times. And I think I would use it a lot more, like, handheld, running around, just kind of getting, like just weird b-roll maybe or like even backpacking yeah if it was like an fx3 readout speed because yeah. anything handheld from that camera just looks so good it's yeah gosh it's good so maybe a faster readout speed i would really appreciate and then like again it's not a huge one because i have a thousand nd filters and like that sigma lens has like such a good nd size with 67 millimeters that yeah you know, it feels it feels even lame to ask for it, but I mean, obviously, if they could put internal NDs, like I'm yeah. gonna take that. And oh, I for, sure. That. <laughs> for sure, for um, sure. But yeah, I don't know. And again, it's it's interesting because, like you said, like I'm gonna guess, and maybe you know better than me, and whether or not you can talk about it, I don't <laughs> know. But like, I would guess we'll get like a new S1H type camera sometime soon. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, if it had internal NDs, it should, that'd be super cool. And then yeah, if you could fix the readout speed, you'd have basically the camera bow used for inside, Yeah. but then it could also run around like an FX3. And I think people would eat that up. Pair that with a, again, that Sigma lens, like, yeah. dude, you could, you could do anything. Oh, and yeah. I mean, even quality wise, like you could film Dune with this camera. Oh, absolutely. And no one would know. Yeah, yeah. Except for maybe that rolling shutter problem. But yeah. otherwise, like the quality is so good. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing too, is that like I love I love my S5 2X, but like there is some things that I like more about Sony. You know, like they do have a faster mm -hmm. readout speed. But I think the yeah. thing that has frustrated me right now, and you know, like we're right in the middle of of NAB. As far as I know right now, there hasn't been any new Panasonic cameras like announced. Mm -hmm. I think that's gonna be more towards like the end of the month, maybe in May or something. I'm not 100% sure. When and if they do announce a new camera, I really just want something that's like how, you know, Sony did with like the A7C, you know, like those cameras. Yeah. Like I want something small, even if it like, even if for some reason they like, like out of left field, they made like an APS-C camera or something like that with an L mount or something. There's just something small to where it's like, I can still use L mount lenses, but I have like a small little camera, you know, like, and that was yeah. the thing that I was talking about in my latest podcast episodes. Like, it's kind of weird having like one of the smallest sensor cameras and then one of the biggest sensor cameras and not being able to use like, you know, like lenses with both. Whereas with yes. Sony, you can, you know, you can use FE lenses on an A67 or a FX30 if you wanted to, you know, and I think that's yeah. where Sony kind of has an advantage. Like they have this huge catalog of like these small little cameras that you can use as B cameras that shoot an S log and you know, you can pair them with like your bigger end cameras. Whereas Panasonic has kind of yet to catch up. Oh, I, I actually, that is such a good point. Well, and it's funny because for a brief stretch, I totally fell into the full frame hype and bought the a seven three when it mm -hmm. was like really hot and man, like, yeah, that body like on paper is not that much smaller than the S5 II, but man, yeah. it felt so much smaller for yeah. some reason. Like it was just a little more tucked in, a little more compact. Ergonomically, it was kind of a nightmare, but personally, I really liked yeah. the size of that camera. And I don't know if they've stuck to that size. Again, I haven't owned a Sony since that camera. Yeah. Um, I hated the video features, but, <laughs> um, but it was, as far as like a photo, like I took that thing backpacking and like with a 
little, like you said, a small e-mount lens and yeah. the autofocus and the little flip screen on the back. Like I took so many pictures with that camera that it was just so fun. But yeah, I, I agree. A smaller, a smaller Lumix camera I would eat up actually. And, and I think, I don't know. And that's where I kind of feel bad because I, I do really dislike the filming process in general. I've just kind of come to that reality where it's like, I love writing the script. I yeah. love editing and I've got to do this middle piece. Yeah. And however we get to, yeah, like that iPhone camera <laughs> is what yeah. I want. And like you're saying, a small A7C style would be way more up my alley. Cause yeah. And I feel like we're moving towards that with like content creation and, you know, like YouTubers, like there are some people who are like the, the traditional filmmakers, you know, who want like the big Sony Venice, you know, and like look super professional. But like in my mind, if I can get the quality of an S5 2X, but somehow get it in an iPhone like sized mm -hmm. camera. I don't care about looking cool on set. I just want to like have a good camera that I can use and it's really, really easy. And a lot of the yeah. times, a lot of the times like you can get better stuff if like the camera is, is smaller. And, you know, especially I'm like, I'm talking mostly as like, you know, content creators, YouTubers, it's so much easier when the camera is smaller. You can just throw it in a backpack. You don't have to think about it too much. I feel like you get more, you know, especially if you're just, you know, like out and about, you know, shooting stuff. It's a lot less intimidating for people if they see you with a small little, you know, G85 sized camera mm -hmm. than with like my S5 2X rigged up with a monitor and, you know. A thousand percent. I hate using my camera in public. And oh yeah. Like, yeah. And it's, it's like the only size that seems to be where people don't care is like the iPhone. Right. Yeah. Like, like, and I think micro four thirds is pretty close. Cause it, they do kind of, especially if you've got like a little prime lens, they kind of look like oh, yeah. toy camera, toy, toy cameras. So uh, again, like I, I, I would probably have bought the G nine too. Yeah. Like had I not invested in all this L mount glass yeah. over the past couple of years and probably been really happy with that camera and actually used it in public a lot more versus yeah. well, and like even backpacking or whatever yeah. like my wife and I on our honeymoon I had the at the time the GH5S and that 15 mil um Ooh, yeah. Lumix lens yeah gosh I mean I filmed on that trip nonstop which I mean again we didn't we didn't have a kid at the time so it was a yeah. heck of a lot easier but even then it was just like man I've just got this tiny little yeah. camera and I could run around I filmed everything and it was so so enjoyable yeah and i feel like, like i'm hoping that like you know like as time progresses like i feel like you know i feel like companies are going to keep making you know those cameras that are like specifically for people that just want have really good quality but not look like they're trying to make the next you know feature film or something like that there does still need to be like that that in between from like an iphone to you know an fx6 or something like that there, like there needs to be like those little cameras for people like us <laughs> well and i should know this but have you used the gh6 or the g92 i have and not I well i mean i have i've held the gh6 but i've never used the g92 um i've been trying to get my hands on one and maybe lumix will send me one at some point but i do know the g92 and the s52 have roughly the same like body size, um, right. <laughs> which is crazy. You'll never be able to find a full frame L mount lens that's as small as like the 50 millimeter, you know, or like the yeah. 14 millimeter pancake. So it's like, yeah, the bodies are the same size, but you can still, I mean, it's a, it, it's like carrying a body with no lens on it, you know, when you put the 14 on, cause you can't even tell it's there. <laughs> yeah, it's like a little chunkier lens. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, I thought that was a weird move. But, and then from what I've heard, I think the GH6 is pretty chunky too. Which, yeah, it's a very big camera and that's- It's got a lot of stuff in it, but- Yeah, and that's where I feel like they hit the nail on the head with the size of this, this G85. This is like the perfect size, but it's just, I mean, it's yeah. like, it lacks almost everything that you would want in a video camera, except for like good image stabilization. But anyways, well, I, I feel like the last- the last question that I had for you is kind of like what your what your goals were with YouTube and video editing. Like, do you have, let's just say your channel blew up tomorrow and you have like 200,000 subscribers. Like, is that something <laughs> where you would want to like pivot what you're doing as a, a career right now and, you know, just go full ham on YouTube? Or is YouTube just going to kind of be like this creative outlet that you can just not have to think about too much? That's a really good question. And I've, yeah, how would I answer that? <laughs> I, as I get older, I definitely find more and more 
that my priority for this is the creative side. Yeah. And I feel like even within the last six or seven months, just really focusing on that, where it's like the videos that I make are totally what I want to make. The conversations with other people is totally just like something I want to do and I just didn't realize it. And now I'm finding that. And yeah. so I think, I think the older I get to answer your question, the more I think this is just a creative outlet. That being said, like you said, if there is a path where this could succeed in a financial aspect, I would absolutely be all in on that and love that. But it does, it does complicate it yeah. because, and I know you're aware of this, right? I mean, it's like when, you, when money gets involved, it gets muddy. And I think yeah. that it would be a challenge, but I would hope that if that started to happen, it would be on the terms of how I've built it, right? And I've come to terms with that too. And I think I talked about that in my last video where it's just like, there may not be a big enough audience for dorky Jake editing and music stuff. Like that just may not exist in the world to like sure. financially put food on the table. And yeah. I think I'm okay with that. You yeah. know, there might be, you know, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how many people are out there that would be interested in the stuff I do. And it keeps growing, which is great. Yeah. Love to see it. Yeah, I mean, you're at you're at like almost 14,000 <laughs> subscribers right now, which is sick. Yeah, and I was at like, I think I was at like five or six, like less than a year ago. So, I mean, yeah, it's been really cool to see people come out and be like, wow, we love your stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, that's cool. Because awesome. I didn't know that there'd be anyone, you know. Yeah. But I think to answer your question, like I, I could definitely see that maybe working out, but I would prioritize, like it would have to be doing the stuff I'm doing now. So if yeah. that wasn't working, then there's got to be, you know, whether that's, the job I have now or editing. Like I, I totally have no morale, moral, not morale, mm -hmm. moral issues with like editing as a job. Like I yeah. can totally detach that from my channel. That actually that cohabitation, that coexistence, I yeah. think is really good for me mentally. Cause as an editor, it's like, what do you need? How do I help enable your vision? How can I work for you? Yeah. But then it's like on my YouTube channel, it's like you're, <laughs> the creator, the shooter, the filmer, you know, it's like you have every control and no one can tell you otherwise. And that's like really therapeutic to then go back to this space of how do I work for you? So long convoluted answer. If it's how I'm doing it now, absolutely. I'm all yeah. in. That sounds great. If not, I think I'm totally happy to work in other, other assets or facets yeah. and that's good. Well, so. dude, I think that's a, I think that's a perfect, like, frame of mind to be in because I feel like that's, I don't know, like I kind of got thrown into this whole like, you know, YouTuber thing pretty mm -hmm. quickly. When that one a video of mine blew up, I was at around the same amount of subscribers that you were at. I was at like 14,000 subscribers and then 2020 hit, that video blew up and I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm making more doing YouTube than I am at my day job. So I'm gonna be a YouTuber now. And it's just like, yeah. it kind of just catapulted me into there where it's just like, there have been like, you know, like ebbs and flows of like my YouTube journey so far. But I definitely think that like, if I could go back, I would come at it from your perspective. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna keep making the stuff that I like to make, not be worried too much about trying to please an audience or whatever. So I think that's a really good, that's a good like uh, mindset that you have for sure. No, and I, it's, it's tough. And I think you're saying people that can get there without having lived it are like superhuman. Like, I don't know mm -hmm. if you watch, uh, I recently talked with Schaefer Nickel. And oh he's yeah, like, dude, he, he's got <sighs> such good videos. He's got such good videos and he's, he has such a level head on his shoulders in this regard where he's just like, it's all about like creative, like his passion in life is like somehow finding a way that he can be creative and like succeed at it. And until kind of similar to like what I just said, like until that works, yeah, he will absolutely find any way possible to keep that creative control by working other ways. You know, yeah. like he has no interest in mixing that until it's like the perfect way basically. Yeah. And um, that's great. I think, I think, yeah, I think he's, he's kind of been my role model in that regard and just getting older. You kind of, yeah. Well, no, dude, you I mean, kind I of learn. Yeah. Like about, I talk about it all the time. Like, it's like, I'm 33 right now. It's like, am I really going to be making YouTube videos when I'm like, you know, in 10 years from now, when I'm like in my mid forties, like there's no way I can keep this mm -hmm. up for that long. Like I got to figure out like a more sustainable way to like grow as like a filmmaker and like a, a creative. So I totally get that. I think you've 
I think you could. It's just oh, yeah. what, what do you want to do, right? But, for sure, for sure. So you okay? So you went full time, which that's super interesting. But then, and again, maybe I'm remembering wrong, but I feel like in your last video you were talking about wanting to start to get maybe more into like DP type stuff. Is that kind of one of your goals going forward? Is is getting into more of that DP director type spa space? I guess that's kind of what you're saying here too. Like, yeah. what what could I do when I'm 40? <laughs> exactly. No, let's like I grew up as like a skate filmer, so I never really had any like you know, classical training in like the filmmaking space. So I've just been teaching myself all this time, but like I would like to get into like smaller end commercials and then maybe just, you know, like work my way up to where I could actually be working as a DP, even just a camera op or like a gaffer or something like that. I'd be totally happy doing any of those as like my main career. And then just, you know, kind of go back to like what you were saying about YouTube where it's like just posting on YouTube as like a creative outlet, you know? I might yeah. make a little bit of money here and there, but like not having to chase sponsorships and appease the algorithm and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. That just seems like something that I could see myself doing more of is just doing more traditional filmmaking work as opposed to being a YouTuber. Not that I don't love this, like it's the best job I've ever had, but like it is just kind of like sporadic, you know, sometimes, I mean, especially mm -hmm. like, it, you know, like I'll have really good months and then I'll have like really bad months. I'm just like, okay, what did I do right there? What did I do wrong there? It's not a natural thing for me. I'm very, like, I'm not the kind of person that always wants to like, you know, like point the camera at himself, you know, I've just kind of like, yeah. had to like learn how to do it. And uh, I mean, it's been super fun, but at the end of the day, I do think that I'd be happier like working, you know, separating my filmmaking work from like my YouTube work, I guess. No, and yeah. I, God, I think about it all the time, dude, because it's just like there's so many nights where, you know, you get off from the – when I get off from the day job and I'm just like, man, it sounds real good to just lay in bed and watch Thrones with my wife yeah. or whatever, you know? Like yeah. it's, it's – it is just this really weird thing that I think, especially our generation, really got attached to – the internet job and i do think mm -hmm. it is awesome like yeah. i think there's there's a lot there but i do think it requires like you're saying this kind of maturity and sense of self that i think a lot of people are really struggling with i mean yeah. the whole quitting topic is so hot <clears throat> but it's just like that what this job can be is a anything therefore you got to know what you want from it because otherwise you might get swallowed up into something you didn't really realize you were signing up for, which is, yeah. and that's kind of what I think is so cool personally is like, I'm kind of glad that my journey has gone the way that it has and it could totally stop right here. And I, you know, whatever that means, I guess stop is kind of, kind of relative, but it's just like, yeah. I'm glad it hasn't like, I'm glad I didn't go viral when I was making yeah. GH5S videos, you know, no, like, seriously, <laughs> because I think I would be really sad right now. And yeah. You'd be like pigeonholed almost into being the GH5S guy. <laughs> and exactly. Like, that's what something that I found myself like, okay, I was pigeonholed into the cheap lighting guy for the longest time. And I'm mm -hmm. just, I've been slowly trying to like work my way out of that. <laughs> no, what I was going to say too is just like, and I think about that right now. It's like, what happens if I get stuck as the editing guy? I'm not hiding it. I'm yeah. calling myself the editing dad. But what for, if I yeah. fall out of love with it? And I think, I think too... And I don't know if anyone's figured this out. I'm trying to figure it out right now where it's like, I've pivoted my whole thing. Yeah. And I think that's probably hurt me because I think there's some people that are just like, wow, I was, you know, I don't watch Jake's video anymore. And then there's all these people that are like, he never makes micro four thirds videos anymore, but yeah. I'm still subscribed. And yeah, yeah. It's, maybe it's dinging the algorithm. I don't know. I don't know how the algorithm works, which is the biggest mystery of all. But yeah, I thought about that too. It's like, well, what happens on the day when I'm like, eh, kind of done with editing. Yeah. Do I go make a new channel? Do I just keep pivoting and like slowly <laughs> dragging new people into new stuff? I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's something that I feel like there probably isn't one right answer to, but you know, I always look to people like, you know, like Craig Adams, like he was very successful in pivoting from like a wedding filmmaker to now he's like a hiking person, you know, like it's like, all right, well he made it work somehow. I feel like I can figure out some way to make it work, especially with my second channel, I feel like that's like been like the biggest thing for me to just like, just post a bunch of, you know, stuff on my second channel. Uh, yes. I, I think it was Patrick Tomaso that like tweeted that. It's like, Hey, if you're ever feeling like, I forget what his actual quote was, but he's just like, make a second channel. It'll help. So I was like, mm -hmm. all right, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> 
yeah, it just like frees your mind. Where yeah. you're like, okay, brand doesn't matter, consistency yeah. doesn't matter. Like, exactly. just go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think too, which this is this is what helps me sleep at night, whether or not it's true, who knows? But I think that again, if you're in it to stay relevant and keep eyes on videos, like no matter what you make, as long as you're making it well, I think that can happen, right? Like, yeah. and I've kind of felt that where it's like, oh, I've had the most success with this, but it's like, well, I just, just cause I know I'm making the better, the best version of a videos I've ever made, you know, like they yeah. actually don't suck anymore. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it's like, I think there's a part of that too, that I try to keep in the back of my mind of like, Hey, whether it's this channel that changes in the future or a new channel or whatever, or I don't know, commercial work, like just got to make good stuff or try to make good stuff. And if that is your goal, then I think you can do it. But also, like you said, if your goal is just to have a place to make whatever, like who cares? That's the goal. That's what's fulfilling you. Like second channel syndrome is just, I just need something to throw stuff at the wall. And that is what my soul needs. Yeah, exactly. If it's successful. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You know, well, man, Hey dude, I think that's a great place to stop. I've, I think I've kept you for a little over an hour now. It seems thank you so much for, for jumping on the podcast, dude. It was really fun talking to you and, uh, you know, tell people where to find you, I guess. Yeah, no, thanks, Nigel. This was absolutely awesome. The hour just flew by. Yeah. Super great talking to you and it was just so easy. Um, uh, yeah, don't be a stranger. For those listening, if you want to come check Jake out, uh, it's just Jake Felzine on YouTube. I'm other places too, but generally speaking, I'm using those other places to just point you to YouTube anyway. So yeah. that would be where I would send people. Sweet. <laughs> Well, yeah, man. Thanks again. And, uh, well, I, I'm probably going to hit you up to jump on a podcast again. If, uh, there's like something that I want to talk about, or if I just want to like, you know, talk more camera stuff for sure. For sure. And I yeah. said this before we recorded, we're going to let it breathe, but we got to talk to you about editing stuff too on my show. So we'll, yeah, we'll absolutely get in there, but cool, man, dude. Well, sick. Thank you so much. Thank you.